This podcast is sponsored by Monarch Money. Are you saving to reach your financial goals? Reaching those goals isn't just about getting more money, but by managing what you have. And the best way to manage your money? Monarch Money. Monarch Money is a new kind of finance app that's intuitive, powerful, ad-free, and takes the headaches out of budgeting. Try it free when you go to monarchmoney.com slash podcast. Monarch puts all your accounts, investments, transactions, and finances at your fingertips. With a complete view of your finances, you'll gain insights on your spending and find new ways to save. Plus, Monarch lets you customize your dashboard, collaborate with your partner, set custom budgets and goals, and track your progress toward them. See why Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and loving it, and why the Wall Street Journal named Monarch Money the best budgeting app overall. Get a 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash podcast. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H money.com slash podcast for your free trial. monarchmoney.com slash podcast. For 40 years, the city of Cedar Rapids wondered if they had a killer among them. And then when the case finally looked like it was solved thanks to DNA, the defense looked back to the evidence collection methods from the 1970s and said this was not such an open and shut case. I'm Charlie and welcome to Crime Lines. Welcome to Crime Lines. Quick reminder that I will be in Albuquerque for a live show on Sunday, March 5th at 4 p.m. Details and a link to get tickets will be in the show notes. And also don't forget to check that description box out for all the links to my social media, YouTube, Patreon, and other events. Okay, so let's get into the case. This story is about Michelle Martinko and is one of Iowa's most famous cases. It's usually a combination of factors that will make a case stick out in the memory of a city or a region. In this case, it was the combination of the shocking nature of the crime as it occurred in a public place where things like this just didn't happen. The victim was a young woman with a bright future and the leads dried up so quickly that the police repeatedly went to the media to try to generate more tips, and all of that gave this case a lot of publicity. But let's back up and talk first about the victim here, Michelle Martinko. She was born when her older sister was 12, and their parents were in their mid-40s. While a surprise like this may have thrown some families for a loop, the Martinkos couldn't be happier. After years of infertility and several miscarriages, they didn't expect that they would be able to have another child. So when Janet Martinko found out she was pregnant at 44, it was definitely a welcome miracle and blessing. And they could not have asked for an easier child to raise. Michelle was a hard worker. She got good grades. She was reliable and responsible. The only real bump in the road was that she was diagnosed with scoliosis, and she had to wear a back brace to prevent the curve in her spine from getting worse as she grew. And this made her feel like she stood out and not in a good way. But she really blossomed after she no longer needed it. Her confidence skyrocketed. As a teen in the late 1970s, Michelle's blonde hair was regularly styled in the Farrah Fawcett look, which anyone familiar with this case can immediately picture since that's the way it is styled in most of the pictures the family and investigators have shared. Michelle was known for being stylish and she had a wide circle of friends, though only a few very close ones. When Michelle was about 15, she met a boy named Andy while they were out roller skating. They dated for about two years, and Michelle's brother-in-law and sister were not huge fans of Andy. They thought he was too controlling, given that this was just a high school relationship. After Michelle broke up with Andy, her next serious-ish boyfriend was named Michael. 
He was a year older than she was, and they broke up in the fall of 1979 while Michelle was a senior and Michael was away at his first semester of college. This is a pretty typical time for teens to break up. Michelle then had some drama with girls at her school over a boy she dated briefly, and anyone who has been in high school friend groups where one person dates someone that either someone else likes or someone else really doesn't like, conflict can happen. But Michelle kept busy with her school activities at Kennedy High School in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. She made plans to go to Iowa State University to study fashion design, and she was focused on enjoying her senior year while she prepared for the next chapter. It wasn't all academics for Michelle. She also worked at a local clothing store, and she was active in extracurriculars like the twirling squad and the choir. On the evening of December 19th, 1979, it was actually that choir that had Michelle out of the house. They had a banquet that night, so Michelle got all dressed up for it in a black dress and her rabbit fur coat. The banquet ended at 7.30, which sounds pretty early, but it was a school night, so that makes sense. And one of Michelle's best friends, Jane, asked her for a ride home. Michelle said she was actually headed to the newly opened West Lake Mall to pick something up and to do a little shopping. She said Jane could come along if she wanted, but Jane had homework to do, so she turned Michelle down and found another way home. At the mall, Michelle bumped into a group of friends who were waiting for a movie to start. They asked if she wanted to join them, but she said she couldn't. One report said that she asked them for a dime to use the payphone to call her mom. She was hoping to pick up a coat that her mom had put on layaway for her, but she couldn't figure out which store it was at. Reports are contradictory on if she talked to her mom that night or not, but we do know she did not pick up the coat. While Michelle was standing with this group of movie-going friends, she saw her ex-boyfriend, Andy. According to Andy, they were friends at this point, and he was actually at the mall buying her a Christmas gift. He didn't expect to see her there since he knew she had the banquet, and he hadn't anticipated it would end so early. Andy was there with another friend who confirmed that they were together and that Andy and Michelle talked for a little bit. Andy told Michelle that he was shopping for her gift so not to follow him. She asked if she could call him later, and he said sure. So the next point in the timeline at the mall was shortly after this when Michelle saw her friend Curtis, who was working in a clothing store. He took a break when he saw her, and they went to the food court together. They chatted for a bit before he then had to get back to work. Michelle told him she was going to go head home, so he walked her to the door and then went back to his job. Another classmate then saw Michelle leaving the mall and heading to the parking lot with a shopping bag. Other people left around the same time she did, but it didn't look like she was with them, and the classmate didn't notice anyone following her. Michelle left the mall between 9 and 10 p.m. Though the mall usually closed at 9, they were open an extra hour for the holiday season. Around 10.30 or 11, an employee leaving the mall after closing saw Michelle's car in the parking lot. It stood out because there were not many cars left, and it was parked a bit crooked. But she didn't think much of it and got in her car and left. It was around the same time that Michelle's mother, Janet, had started calling around to Michelle's friends. She expected her daughter home by around 8.30 or so. And even if Michelle stayed at the mall until close, she would have been home by 10.30. But no one Janet talked to knew where she was. One of the people Janet called was Andy. He said Michelle wasn't with him. Then around midnight, Janet called again, letting Andy know that she still hadn't heard from Michelle and wondered if he had. He said he still hadn't, but he offered to go drive around a bit to see if he could find her, and his mother went with him. After an hour of driving around, they found nothing. 
At 2 a.m., still unable to find Michelle anywhere, the Martinkos called the police. But they didn't then sit back and wait. They kept making calls, and eventually they called the police back to say that they could not find anyone who saw Michelle after she had been at the mall. So a patrol officer went out to the mall to look around. It was around 4 a.m. when he noticed the family's Buick Electra parked outside the mall. The front doors were locked, but the rear passenger side door was not. The officer pulled it open, and there he saw Michelle's body sitting on the front passenger floorboards slumped over. She had no signs of life. He radioed it in, and the homicide investigators responded to the scene. Michelle was found fully dressed with even her pantyhose still on. The autopsy would confirm that there were no signs of a sexual assault. Michelle had been stabbed to death, with there being a total of 29 sharp edge wounds to her body, with 11 of them being stab wounds. The fatal stab was to her chest. Michelle also had defensive wounds on her hands and arms and a laceration to her head. The murder weapon, which was not left at the scene, was a knife that was likely four to five inches long. Based on the pattern from the stab wounds, it appeared to either be a curved blade or double-edged. The autopsy put the time of death approximately between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. But based on the circumstantial evidence of when she left the mall and when the car was seen in the parking lot, it was likely on the earlier side of that time frame. The car was the primary and possibly only crime scene, so it was sealed up and taken in for full processing. Inside the car, they found tufts of fur matching Michelle's coat. These were all around the car, indicating that there had been a struggle while she was wearing it. In checking for prints, they found a chevron pattern in the dust on the door handle and in the blood on the gear shift, light switch, steering wheel, and key. An investigator recognized this pattern as possibly being what is found on rubber dishwashing gloves. This was later confirmed when they went to the store and bought some to compare it. But this was a mass-produced item, so it didn't help narrow down the killer, though it did tell the police that he came prepared. This was not an impulsive attack. The killer made sure he was wearing gloves. Since there was a bloody glove print on the steering wheel, some on the gear shifter, and the key, it seemed possible that the killer had entered the car by force, driven it elsewhere to commit the crime, and then dumped it back at the mall, leaving all that blood transfer on those surfaces. If that was what happened, it would have made more sense for the car to have been dumped elsewhere, maybe even hidden somewhere. The only reason I can think of to risk returning to the mall in that car would be if the killer's own vehicle was parked there and he needed to get back to it to make his getaway. Otherwise, he risked getting spotted and his description handed over to the police. And it wasn't just the blood evidence that initially made the police wonder if the car had been moved. It was parked a bit farther back from the mall entrance than you would think an 18-year-old would have parked it. Unless, of course, the lot was pretty full that night, which was possible since this was during the holiday shopping season. But they also noticed the car was parked crooked, making it look like someone possibly parked it quickly. But that also could have been Michelle. A friend said she wasn't the best driver in the world, and she was trying to park a 1972 Buick Electra. When I was a kid, we called these cars boats because they had those long hoods. They are not easy to park, which might have been another reason why it was parked a little out of the way, to avoid hitting a car in the spot next to her. In the end, based on witness statements on where Michelle had parked and the totality of the circumstances, 
The police eventually settled on the theory that the entire crime happened in the mall parking lot. Here is what the police think may have happened. Michelle walked to her car after leaving the mall. She unlocked the driver's door and reached back to unlock the back door, the one that the police officer found unlocked. She opened that door to put her shopping bag inside. She then got into the driver's seat. She was about to start the car when the killer approached and he yanked her door open, leaving a print in the dirt on the handle. He then hit Michelle on the head, stunning her, and pushed his way into the car. Because Michelle's purse was untouched, as was the $180 she was going to use to buy her new coat, they don't believe the motive here was robbery. They believed it was either a targeted attack on Michelle if the killer was someone she knew, or it was an attempted sexual assault if it was someone she didn't know. Michelle fought back as the man was over her with a knife, trying to hold her down. He became more and more aggressive and angry as the fight continued, and he stabbed her. In the car with an 18-year-old bleeding to death, the killer considered driving the car somewhere else and dumping it. Maybe he even started it up, and that's when he transferred the blood from his gloves to the key, the steering wheel, and the gear shift. But then he changed his mind, opting instead to get out of there before he was seen. Blood scrapings from these surfaces were collected and stored as evidence, as were Michelle's dress coat and pantyhose. And then the police set out to investigate if this was a random killer who was waiting on any woman to come out of the mall, or was this killer someone known to Michelle, someone who was stalking her? The first look was at the boys in her life, and both Andy and Michael came up. Michael had a rock-solid alibi of being two hours away at college that night. Andy, however, was a local and even admitted to being at the mall that night, and he was the one the police looked at closest. His alibi was that after he left the mall, he and his friend went to a strip club, then a bar, and then home. His alibi witness after that was his mother, who swore that he was at home, but she is his mom, and some moms will sometimes lie to protect their kids. I'm not saying all moms would lie in this situation, but we know some do, and we actually have a case coming up in a couple of weeks where the mom did at least attempt to lie. Michelle's family definitely suspected Andy. He had not taken the breakup well, and he would talk to Michelle's friends to find out where she was and who she was dating and what was going on. He insisted that things between them were friendly by the time of her death, so much so that he was buying her a Christmas gift. But her family and even some investigators were not so sure. At Michelle's funeral, Andy was very emotional, and you know how we've talked about it before that once someone is suspected of something, everything they do seems to confirm it. That definitely happened here, with some people wondering if Andy was so emotional because he was grieving or because he was guilty. After Michelle's death, Andy enlisted in the Navy and moved away. Though Andy seemed a strong person of interest, not all of the investigators thought that the killer must be someone Michelle knew. There was a similar attempted assault in Cedar Rapids nine days after Michelle's murder. A man with a knife forced his way into the car of a 19-year-old woman in a parking lot. He held the knife while ordering her to take off her clothes. She stalled, and then, when his attention was diverted, she managed to get out of the car and take off running. This is the same area, the same basics of the attack, and even the same victimology. But I couldn't find if this case was resolved or not in the newspaper archives I have available. And unless someone knows otherwise, I would still consider this possibly linked 
And if you are a person who knows otherwise or has more information specifically on this, please email it to me because I am interested in learning more about how these two cases may or may not be connected. Something that I find a little frustrating about this Michelle Martinko case is that from the start, as high profile as it was, generating tips was an issue. It seemed that most people who saw anything came forward early on, and from there the leads started drying up. It also seems like they had witnesses of every move Michelle made through that mall up until she started crossing that parking lot, and then suddenly not a single person saw anything. There was a tip that came in in April of 1980, so four months after the murder, but it's the worst type of tip. The ones that look like hoaxes, but the police still have to waste their time and resources following up on it anyway, just in case. This tip came in the form of a note in a bottle, and I mean that literally. This is not some figurative way to explain it. A bottle was fished out of the river, and inside of it was a piece of paper. On that note, someone was asking for help, and the writer said they were being held hostage in a cabin by Michelle Martinko's killer. They indicated the area the cabin was, but then signed the note with just their initials. The initials thing was a big red flag. If this person was really in danger, really held captive, trying to get a message to the outside world, and they had time to sign the note, they would have written their name. But the police still had to follow up on this, doing a door-to-door search in the area and, as expected, finding nothing. A month after this, which is five months after the murder, a new witness came forward with a very credible lead. She said she had driven past the mall around 2 a.m. on the night of the murder. She was sure it was that night because she was passing the mall after dropping a friend home after a Christmas dance. She said there were two cars in the parking lot at the time parked right next to each other. She saw a man standing next to the open driver's side of one of the cars, a car consistent with Michelle's car. She said that when her vehicle was stopped and she looked over, the man noticed her and took a step closer to the car with the open door as though he was hiding something. At the time, she thought it was probably some young people up to something, but it wasn't her business, so she just headed home. When she read about the murder later, she immediately thought about what she saw, but the papers were reporting the time of death as being between 10 p.m. and midnight. The belief that the attack had happened before midnight was based on how unlikely it was that Michelle had gone to her car between 9 and 10 p.m., but then wasn't killed for hours after that. Also, there was a frost layer on the windshield that looked like it had been there undisturbed for hours. Since what this witness saw was two hours past that window, she didn't know if it was connected. Not wanting to be one of those people who wastes police time, she instead called her friend, who had a family member who worked for the public safety commissioner. She gave the info to her to pass it on to the commissioner. If it was important, the police could contact her, but if it was irrelevant, then she wasn't wasting their time chasing down a nothing lead. When she didn't hear from the police, she assumed they must have ruled it out, but the police had actually never gotten her tip. The commissioner later said that he didn't remember getting that specific tip. He was getting quite a few calls in the days after the murder and said, had he gotten her story, he would have passed it on. But then the months dragged on and the woman decided to call the police directly herself after they put out another public appeal for information in May, admitting that they had few new leads to pursue. What the woman saw fit the theory that the killer had moved the car and then drove it back to the parking lot at some point. However, it's also possible that he left the scene and returned later after everyone was gone, perhaps to make sure Michelle was dead. Just because the sighting happened at 2 a.m. and the murder likely happened before midnight, it didn't mean this woman did not see the killer. 
She was hypnotized, as was another unspecified witness, and they developed a composite sketch of the killer from this. And then the police debated whether or not to release it. Just like putting out the time of death made a potential witness not come forward with her info, they didn't want the sketch to do the same. So let's say there was a person out there whose brother or father or husband was out all night and came home acting strangely. This person is on the verge of calling in the tip, but then the sketch comes out. Looks nothing like the person they suspect, so they decide not to call. This could backfire. But since no other tips were coming in, they decided, with some hesitation, to release the composite in June. But no promising leads came from it. In 1981, Michelle's ex, Andy, was interviewed again. This time, he mentioned that Michelle had told him she was at work when she saw what she described as a grotesquely ugly man watching her. The incident creeped her out, and it was about four days before her murder. The issue with this information is that it's an incredibly vague report that didn't narrow it down much. Was this man a customer, a coworker, someone lurking in the shadows? Did he have brown hair or blonde? And what does grotesquely ugly even mean to an 18-year-old? Hyperbole and sarcasm can prize a great deal of a teenager's daily language. No one else had any details about this, so it went nowhere. Over the years, this became one of those cases where no one was a suspect, yet everyone was. Every serial killer who could pretty much point Iowa out on a map was looked into, and they were all ruled out pretty quickly. Either the crime had no semblance of their other murders, or they were known to be elsewhere in the country at the time, or they were incarcerated. As I mentioned a few weeks ago in the Roger Atkinson and Rose Burkert episode, the bartender at the hotel where Roger and Rose were killed, his name was Ron, He worked at the Westlake Mall at the time Michelle was murdered. A friend had indicated to the police that Ron was acting strangely after Michelle's murder and soon left the area. He was interviewed in 1983 about both the Amana killings and Michelle's murder. After all, he worked in two places where brutal murders happened nine months apart. As we know from that other episode, there was no evidence that he was involved in either murder, and some of the stories about him that make him look suspicious weren't even true. The Michelle Martinko case got a lot of publicity over the years and several appeals for information, but it quickly grew cold. Things started to change with the advent of DNA testing, as we see often in these cold cases. In 1997, evidence from the crime scene was sent to the lab, and they found a mixed profile, meaning there was male DNA mixed in with Michelle's blood. It was tested again in 2002 and 2005 as DNA technology started to be able to test smaller samples and mixed samples. So in 2002, a partial male profile was found on the gear shift but they couldn't enter it into CODIS, the FBI's DNA database, because they only had 11 loci, and CODIS requires at least 15. In 2005, more evidence was processed, and a full male profile was found on Michelle's dress. The partial profile was consistent with the full profile, meaning that none of the points of comparison didn't match. But since it was a partial profile, there's always that itsy-bitsy chance that they didn't match it on the points they couldn't compare. They couldn't compare them because they were missing. Now, the full profile was uploaded into CODIS with no hits ever coming through. Because both profiles were in blood, the assumption was that the killer had bled a little. Maybe he cut himself on the knife during the stabbing. Maybe Michelle hit him in the nose or on his lip and a little blood came out. However, we don't know that for sure because the source of the DNA could not be confirmed. It could have been blood, but it also could have been saliva or some other source. But with the profile developed, the investigators could start testing people. 160 males were tested, including Andy. 
and there were no matches. Andy was finally and officially cleared. Now, it is a very good thing they did this testing when they did, because in June of 2008, Cedar Rapids was hit with massive flooding as the Cedar River hit its highest level in recorded history. 14% of the city was flooded, displacing 18,000 residents and hundreds of buildings and businesses and schools were severely damaged. And among those spaces was the evidence storage room for the Cedar Rapids police. And that included the evidence from Michelle's murder. So thankfully, they had tested the dress three years before because it had to be sent out to a professional disaster relief company to dry it out and make sure it wasn't contaminated by mold or mildew. But this process meant any further testing of the dress would be compromised. And if it wasn't compromised, the chain of evidence and the reliability of the testing would have made easy work for any marginally competent defense attorney to challenge. So let's take a second and be thankful the detective in 2005 sent the dress in for testing. This case may have had a very different outcome if they did not have that full profile. So the police had this profile, but a DNA profile is like a fingerprint. It's only good if you have someone to match it to. Or at least that's what we used to say before 2018. In the 20-teens, Parabon Nanolabs was becoming known for building sketches of suspects based on their DNA profile. They were able to determine that the killer was a white male with blonde hair and blue eyes, and they produced a sketch with a variety of common hairstyles of the time. But there were some limits with these sketches, like how they can't tell from DNA if the killer was 20 or 60. But it was a new avenue they didn't have before, and it gave the Cedar Rapids police a working relationship with Parabon Labs. In April 2018, with the arrest of the Golden State Killer, the Cedar Rapids cold case detective over Michelle's case decided to ask Parabon about genetic genealogy. The investigator in charge at this point was the son of one of the original investigators on Michelle's case. Parabon used GEDmatch, which is a public DNA database, to find the closest relative to the source of the DNA. They got to a woman who lived in Washington state who was a second cousin once removed. It was likely she did not even know the person they were looking for, but it was a start. Parabon sent this match to the cold case investigator, who then used his detective skills to start building out that woman's family tree. He found other relatives of hers and asked for DNA samples. He sent them off to Parabon, who would let him know if he was getting closer or if he was out on the wrong branch. Through this process, the detective got to a first cousin of the source of the DNA. And after sending that information to Parabon, they identified three brothers who could be the source. They were Donald, Kenneth, and Jerry Burns. They grew up in Manchester, Iowa, which was less than an hour north of Cedar Rapids. The police followed all three men to get a DNA sample. They ruled out Donald and Kenneth, but Jerry looked like a match, but the sample was not a strong one. They had followed him to a restaurant and took a straw from his drink after he left. The lab wanted a stronger sample before they called it case closed. So on December 19th, 2018, the police went to Jerry's business in Manchester. They purposely went on the anniversary of Michelle's murder in the hope that it added some pressure and put Jerry off his game a bit. Jerry would have been 25 years old at the time of the murder and 64 when the police approached him. They didn't tell him that they had his DNA already. They just said that they released the DNA Parabon sketch and got tips that Jerry looked like the guy when he was younger. Jerry looked at the sketch and said he didn't think it looked like him. He was asked about his awareness of the Michelle Martinko murder, and Jerry said he had read about the case in the paper a while ago. Jerry admitted he had been to the Westlake Mall with his wife and kids that holiday season, but he didn't believe he was there on the night of the murder. The investigator then asked Jerry for a buckle swab for DNA, 
which they had a warrant for, so Jerry didn't have much room to argue. After they took the sample, the investigator asked Jerry how his DNA ended up at the murder scene. Jerry seemed a little confused. I mean, remember, he didn't know that they had taken the straw, so he thought they just took the sample that minute and couldn't possibly know if his DNA was at the scene or not. So Jerry told them, test the DNA and see. They then asked him if he murdered anyone, and he said he wasn't there, he didn't know anything, and to go ahead and test the DNA. They then arrested him for the murder of Michelle Martinko. In the car, they read Jerry his rights and kept questioning him. The car did have video and audio, so this was recorded. The interview at Jerry's work was also recorded thanks to a hidden camera the investigator had. Jerry was asked what happened the night Michelle died, and he brought up a cousin who was struggling with finances at the time and then went missing. And then he mentioned another cousin who he said was a previous suspect in the case. So it sounded like he may have been trying to explain why someone with DNA like his could have been the killer. But it wasn't DNA like his. It was the same DNA. After the new sample was sent to the lab, it was confirmed that Jerry Burns was the source of that DNA sample, though he seemed an extremely unlikely suspect for a murder. He had no connection to Michelle at all. 25-year-old Jerry would not have been described as ugly, even by an 18-year-old standards, let alone grotesquely ugly, so he wasn't the man who made her uncomfortable at work. He had No criminal record, no history of violence. He was a family man and a respected business owner. Had someone who committed such a shocking murder in 1979 then spend the next 39 years as though nothing happened and without committing another crime? Because the investigator certainly looked to see if it was possible Jerry did commit another violent crime. No evidence pointed at him for any other case. The only thing they found that might fit the profile of someone with violent tendencies came from a search of Jerry's work computer. There were searches for violent pornography, including things like stabbings, rape, strangulation, and even sex with freshly dead persons. That was the closest thing they had to showing Jerry to be the type of person who may have committed a crime like this. But the jury would never hear about it. His defense team successfully argued to have it excluded. The judge ruled that internet searches that occurred 30 plus years after the murder fell solidly into being more prejudicial than probative. The defense also got a change of venue due to the 40 years of publicity on the case. What they did not get kicked was the DNA evidence. That was in at trial. If the judge had ruled to exclude it, I imagine the charges would have been dismissed because the DNA was the case. The trial was held in February 2020 with Michelle's sister and brother-in-law representing the family. Her father had died in 1995 and her mother in 1998, still believing that Michelle's ex-boyfriend had gotten away with her murder. So the state's case here, pretty obvious. The DNA tells the story. They also had a former cellmate of Jerry's testify, but I put no stock in what he had to say, and I really wish they would stop using incentivized witnesses unless there is a recording or a corroboration of the conversation from another witness. Now, the defense was that Jerry Burns was not guilty and his DNA was at the crime scene due to transfer. Even an innocent interaction could lead to DNA transferring from him to Michelle, and then to the car. They had an expert testify about how transfer DNA happens, though on cross-examination, the expert stated that he was not saying that was how Jerry's DNA got to the crime scene. He simply testified on how it could have happened. And I would find the idea of transfer DNA more persuasive if Jerry's DNA wasn't found in two spots, the dress and the gear shift. But the defense anticipated the jury having the same issue I have and questioned the integrity of the investigation and the preservation of the evidence. In 1979, when they weren't thinking about DNA testing, evidence wasn't bagged quite the same way it is today. For instance, all of Michelle's clothing was tossed into a single bag, 
when current standards would have each piece bagged separately. While the blood scraping from the gear shift wasn't stored in the same bag as the dress, the responding officer who opened the car didn't wear gloves. Now, did those who did wear gloves change them in between handling pieces of evidence? Could Jerry's DNA have transferred innocently onto Michelle's dress, and then the police transferred it from the dress to the gear shift through not changing gloves in between touching evidence? I mean, I guess it's possible. I'm having a tough time with the idea that Michelle had enough DNA from Jerry on her that it transferred again during the processing of evidence. The defense tried to bolster that this was an innocent transfer by also arguing that the DNA did not come from Jerry's blood. Blood is one of the best sources for DNA, and if he was actively bleeding, they asked why his DNA was only found in two spots in the vehicle, and one of those was just a partial profile. Now, the state argued it was possible that most of the blood pooled in the rubber gloves he was wearing, and that's how he avoided bleeding all over the place. So the jury took the case, and after three hours of deliberation, Jerry Burns was found guilty. At sentencing, he was given life without parole. And with that, Michelle's surviving family and her friends, a couple who lived under a cloud of suspicion, finally had the answers they were looking for, even though the answer seemed unlikely. Jerry Burns, a family man with no past or future violent acts, had attacked Michelle Martinko in the mall parking lot and then stepped back into his life to celebrate the holidays with his family, and then go on for 39 years as though nothing happened. But according to Jerry Burns, that's not what happened at all. He maintains his innocence and is currently appealing his conviction. His attorney is famed wrongful conviction advocate Kathleen Zellner. Thank you for listening. You can find Crimelines on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and occasionally TikTok. Crimelines is on Patreon, where I offer early and ad-free episodes, as well as bonus content. Visit patreon.com slash crimelines. If you want to buy me a coffee, the official drink of Crimelines, you can give a one-time donation at basementfortproductions.com slash support. And if you need a palate cleanser after listening to heavier true crime shows, check out Rusty Hinges, an allegedly funny history, mystery, and true crime show that I co-created and write for.